Paul comes and he writes and he says, I want to know nothing amongst you except who? Christ. Christ. And him crucified. Hallelujah. So that is, that is where our power is. That is where we draw our strength from. Knowing that Christ paid the price so that we can be free no matter what. But all of us go through complications. Hallelujah. If your stomach is not lacquer, you go through complications. If your neighbor offends you, you go through complications. If things don't work out according to how you see it fit, you have complications. If ESCOM switches your power off 8 o'clock in the morning, you have complications. But don't let the complications direct the path of your life. Because it is Christ that sets the path for our lives. See, He has created a way for us. And that John, He says, He is the way, the way, the truth, and the life. So, in our lives, we need a way. You know, we are lost if we don't have our way. Have you seen some lost people? Have you been lost? So, He is our way. Have you heard people lie to you? Have you told a lie? Yes. <laughs> you have, everyone has to have lied in their lives some point or another. I even see kids. I mean, my boy is four. <laughs> Did you eat sugar? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because truth sets you free. But first it will make you very angry. But truth sets you free in the end. So Christ is the truth. And life. He is our life. In this life, you can be alive but not living. But the life that Christ came is that you might have life and have life more abundantly. So this life that he's talking about is an uncomplicated life. You see, things are as complicated as you make it to be. <laughs> All right. Okay. So this morning, there is nothing. And there is all. I can't do it the other way around because the cross is the dividing line between all and nothing. It's either nothing or all. But in our earthly language, we say all or nothing. Have you heard that saying? Yeah. It's either all or nothing. So this morning, I want to tell you, it's either all or nothing. He gave his all so that you have to keep back nothing. So when we step into Christ, we have everything. So nothing that we can give can qualify us to be what he called us to be. Nothing that we give can open the way, the truth, or the life. Yeah. Because He has given it all so that we can just step into it. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. So it's not complicated. You're the one complicating it. Uh, so let's talk about this. Love. When Paul writes, where does he write about love? It's in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. So though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Have you heard a tinkling cymbal? <laughs> Man, that's irritating when it's alone. <laughs> and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not and vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemingly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. It bears all things. Ha! It beareth all things. It believeth all things. Huh? 
and it hopeth. All things and it endureth. <laughs> uh, endureth all things. Love never fails. It never fails. Whew. But where there be prophecy, they shall fail, and where there be tongues, they shall cease. Neither shall there be knowledge, and it shall vanish away. For we know in part and prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I stood as a child, and I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then, face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I also am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Ooh. The greatest is love. So we find that greater love has no man than a man that laid down his life for his friends. And God so loved the world that he gave up his only son so that all that believe on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Ah, so all that believe on him will have everlasting life because the greatest of these is love. And what is love? Love is all things. It beareth all, it believeth all, it hopeth all, it endureth all, and it never fails. So, I want to tell you this morning, if we step into this, you will never fail. Hallelujah. So nothing. What happens when we are in a place of nothing? We constantly look for acknowledgement. We constantly look for praise. <laughs> Never happy. Never satisfied. And the best thing of all is, you will always have a backup plan. <laughs> so all or nothing. You know, when you, get to the, when you get to that point where you say all or nothing, it means there's no backup plan. Yeah. It means that's what I'm about to do is going to take everything for me. And if it fails, my goodness. Like this morning, I had a backup plan. <laughs> <laughs> and it failed. <laughs> but in our life, when we look at Jesus, he's standing there and seeing, saying to us, it's either all or nothing. You cannot be one side believing I can do all things, on the other side, stand and think you're going to do it on your own. Hallelujah. You see, there's a backup plan when you are in the place of nothing, but when you are in all, there is no reserves. Woo! Okay. So now I want to touch on a, a different thing. We are all people. We are different colors. We are different sizes. <laughs> Some of us have more hair than others. But we all breathe the same air. We all walk on the same ground. We all have the same Father. We all have the same Bible. But all of us see everything differently. Every one of us reacts differently to everything around us. So why do certain people change when things around them change? When the flow that is in your life changes, why does it change you? Let's just take for example, when someone gets a higher income, he starts buying different things. Doesn't go to Pep anymore, now he goes to Nike. When someone receives more power, 
it changes. When someone receives more authority, it changes. I mean, I first noticed it in school when one of my friends became a prefect. So the previous day, we were playing nicely together, and the next day, he thinks he's better than me, telling me to keep quiet. <laughs> but I mean, yesterday, we were still playing together, but the next day, he is in a different level than me. And it changes him. <laughs> more knowledge. Have you ever seen someone acquiring more knowledge? I have a PhD now. I'm better than you. I can correct you now because you are wrong. But still, we are still the same people. Our bodies are still made up of the same structure. What has changed? Your thinking. The way you see things change. But yet we are still all the same. <laughs> when we encounter problems, some people take the problem personally and it changes them. You can see it on their faces. If I look at your faces, I can see who has problems in their lives right now. I don't need to be a prophet. Your face shows me that you have problems in your life. When we have needs, when we have situations, when we have circumstances, these things change us. Ha. Huh. Let's go to James 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, it worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect, entire, wanting and lacking nothing. Perfect. Entire. Wanting nothing. <clears throat> now, I want to do this example today because there are always three parts. There is nothing, there is Christ, and there is all. Body, mind, spirit. <laughs> God, Father, Son. <laughs> You are made up of three parts. You have a body, a mind, and a spirit, as the world relates to the soul. So, our perfect image is Christ, because there we are perfect, we are entire, wanting nothing. When we are in this part, we give everything. Where we are in this part, we want everything. But where we are in this part, we are giving and wanting everything, it doesn't matter what we get or what we give because we are then perfect, entire and wanting nothing. See, when people receive things, they change. Sometimes people give things in order to receive things, to get acknowledgement and to get praise. <laughs> Jesus talks, he says, don't be like the Pharisees that stands on the corners and do these things so that men can see them. But you, go into the inner room where no one looks. Ah, this is beautiful. Okay. So, but let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and he gives to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth, is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not man think that he shall let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. Alright, by a raise of right hand, who has ever heard that scripture? Okay. Great. So a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. In all his ways. In all his ways. He is the way. He is not an unstable way. He is the way. There's no two ways. So when we walk in that way, you cannot fall. 
Right, so that is one, and that is two. One, two. A double-minded man. If you are stuck between all or nothing, you are unstable. Okay. Let the brother of low decree rejoice that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. Pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of it fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endure temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. And let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. <laughs> every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither a shadow of turning. God that gives us life, that gives us gifts, has one way. <laughs> he doesn't even turn on that way. It's a straight road. There's no shadow of turning in him. Of his own will will he beget, us, beget he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. Whew. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Woo. Hallelujah. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goes away, and straightway forgets what manner of man he is. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds." Whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty. Now what does that make you think of? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He continued therein, and being not forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. And if any man amongst you seem to be religious and builds not his tongue, whoo, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion is undefiled before God, and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted. Huh? Someone, someone got lazy to read, and they put the audio Bible on. <laughs> Whew, what is a double-minded man? It's a man that's looking between all and nothing, trying to figure out, Am I going this way? Am I going that way? And in the end, he goes, he goeth, no weareth. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever felt that you're going nowhere? <laughs> Have you ever sat in a place where it's difficult to make a decision? Yo, I... Sorry, I can't hear. Wait till you get to 80. Oh. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> All right. So at least I, I have experienced it. That sometimes it's difficult to make a decision and you end up not making a decision. Yeah. And we start using uh, examples like, no, I'm waiting on the Lord. And I believe every time you say you're waiting on the Lord, the, the Lord is saying, but I'm you. 
You see, indecision is more dangerous than making a wrong decision. Because if you are stuck with an indecision, you don't know yes or no. And you are double-minded. And you become unstable in everything. Because that will cause a ripple effect into the rest of your life. Because you are going nowhere. <laughs> so indecision is more dangerous than making a wrong decision. My backing on that is, in Romans 8, it says everything works out for good for those that love God, that walk according to? So that means, even if I make the wrong decision, God will cause that wrong decision to benefit someone else because He has created us to benefit other people, to benefit the body. Now, the story of Joseph, you find it in um, Genesis 50, verse 20 where Joseph got sold by his brothers uh, into slavery because of his dream. God gave him a purpose, a will. And then Joseph stayed true to the dream, even though his whole life was just filled with misery, <laughs> betrayal, pain, a million chances to doubt the dream and give up. But Joseph did not give up. Nothing came to him. Nothing. If something came to him, it got taken away. <laughs> but in the end, when uh, everything, when he, his brothers found out it was him standing in front of them, he says, Do not be afraid. I think he says, Do not be afraid, for I am standing in the place of God. What you have meant for evil, God has meant for good. Going to Romans 8, everything will work out for good for those who love God and who walks according to His purpose. So, <laughs> we are not made to be indecisive people. When we know what spirit we have, when we know who we look to, it doesn't matter if we make a wrong or a right choice. Because we judge ourselves so harshly on making the right choice that sometimes we end up making no choice at all. <laughs> and we find ourselves double-minded. So double-minded, for me, it works like this. Let's just do this. There's one and there's two. And I'm going to do it like this. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have faith and say we all have been through school, right? <laughs> we all have passed, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's two cells, a positive and a negative. This morning, we tried to start the generator. It has a battery. It's got a positive and a negative. If I put the battery next to the generator and I try to start the generator, nothing's going to happen because there is no flow. There is no current. So the moment these things work is when there goes a current into them. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. We're getting there. So double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Okay, let's... This is going to be a funny drawing. <laughs> we have a left and a right. It's quite funny how it works out that you have two brains. You have a creative side and a cognitive side. Is that correct in saying that? Some people use the creative side and they leave the other side and it shows. <laughs> <laughs> Some people use the other side and leave the other side and it shows as well. But then you get people that just use like both sides and they can do everything. Have you ever met people like that? Sometimes you feel it's like, yo, I wish I was blessed like that guy. But you have the same, you are structured the same, there's nothing different between you and him. It's just the way that he uses what has been given to him. And this is the, the thing, is we get programmed from a young age into certain areas to think certain ways. 
I believe that's why Paul says, beware of these doctrines of men that wants to deceive you, that wants to keep you from the life of God. So if we have two brains, this is where the double-mindedness comes in. And this is the picture that I'm seeing that I want to just go with you. I hope it's going to bless you. You have your negative, which is all those things. You have your positive, which is all those things. So, you are looking at plan B <laughs> before you even start with plan A. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm not picking on anyone. <laughs> then you have the positive side, which has no reserves. It means you're going to go for this no matter what. So, in one person, you have both these ways. War. It is a war. Yeah. Because they are separated. So it means you are squint. Have you, have you seen someone looking like that? You don't know what eye to look at. I'm sorry. <laughs> A double-minded man. Squint. He's <laughs> <a> squint. <laughs> Hallelujah. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways because he will look to both sides and he doesn't know where to go. But once, look, positive and negative, they are both good. You cannot remove negative from your life. Because together, they make the current the flow. They produce what you need. So in our lives, we try so hard to remove the negative out of our lives, yeah. not knowing that it, it doesn't matter what is wrong or what is right in your life. Because once you start understanding that there is a flow, there is a unity between them, then you can start seeing where you are going. Then you can look straight ahead. And that is where you get the life, the way, and the truth. <laughs> so storms is not the only problems and difficulties that we face in our lives. And why I say that is, a wise man is like a... Like a tree, almost there. A wise man is like one who? Builds his house on a rock. A wise man is like one who builds his house upon the rock. Yeah. So we get a rock, one that builds his house on the rock, and then we have one that builds his house on the sand. A wise man is like one who builds his house upon the rock. And when the storm comes, the house will stand. Yeah. But the fool is the one that builds his house on the sand. And when the storm comes, it is washed away. <coughs> and what I'm seeing in this picture is storms is not only bad things. Yeah. It is everything that happens in our life. If we try to build our lives on just one thing, just on the positive thing, Let's say you get money, power, and fame. <laughs> what is the opposite of these ones? <laughs> Poverty. <laughs> Poverty. Weakness. And shame. Obscurity. Obscurity. You see, if we, if we build our house on just this, that's why you, you find people, when they get more authority, they get more power, they get puffed up. When they get more knowledge, they get puffed up. They change. The things that happens to them changes them. So these are good things, but it changes them. It makes them unstable. 
Then on the other hand, you get people that never gets out of poverty, always in weakness, always with shame. The house cannot stand. So these things, are they wrong? We tend to think that money and power and fame is wrong because it corrupts people. Everything that comes your way, good or bad, creates storms in your life. Negative and positive will create storms in your life. But if your mind is stable, ha. Huh, now, when you have a stable mind, you have vision. When it's unstable, you have division. And it shows. It's division. So the Word, the Word of God produces seed. <laughs> I'm going to bring this over. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So if we receive the Word of God and we try to bring it in either negative or positive, we try to balance it out, it completely just goes past us. So in other words, you have your positive and your negative, and the, you have the Word of God, and it just goes past you. There is no fruitful place in your life. What does the word say? A sower goes out to sow seed. Some fall along the way, some fall on rocky ground, some fall on uh, fruitful soil. He says the sower is God and the seed is the word. So when God sows his seed, which he does to all of us, and we tend to either be stuck in nothing or in all, the word passes us by. But when we find that place, that unity, the Word can find entrance into our lives and it produces. Yeah. It produces what? Vision. It produces provision. You either have provision. Okay, let us put it this way. There is vision. You have vision. You either have provision or you have no vision. <laughs> so all of us have vision. You either have provision or no vision because the vision will become your provision. How do we get vision? It goes back to this. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, and he has no vision. That's why I say indecision will cause you to have no vision in your life. But we have the Word of God, which teaches us all things. So let the Word find entrance into your life, so that you have fruitful ground in you, so that the Word will produce the vision in your life. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's go to Romans 8. So Romans 8, it says, Therefore there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the flesh will always put you in the place of all and or nothing. But the Spirit, it produces something completely different. It says, walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. 
For to be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but they that are in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. <laughs> and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, my brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if any of you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led of the Spirit, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity. <laughs> not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only they, ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man sees, why does he hope for it? But if we hope for that which we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmity, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Can I get an amen? amen? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, <laughs> to them who are called according to the purpose, to His purpose. For whom he did foreknew, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestine, he them also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, he glorified. Verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us. Who can be against us? I'm just taking you back to James 1. It says, double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And when you go to the end, he says, we are looking as into a mirror. And we are turned into his image. And as he will see us as we are known. So as we are looking unto him, unto the perfect image. That's why Paul says, I want to know nothing amongst you except Christ and Him crucified. It's not about the good that you've done. It's not about the bad that you've done. It's what He has done. So your good and your bad doesn't even matter. On, your wrong choice it. and your right choice doesn't even matter in the end. All He needs from you is to have a single mind so that you can have vision. The only way you ever in this life is going to have a single mind is if you look to Him. Yeah. If you look to the yeah. perfect image, yeah. which is Christ. Because yeah. what you focus on is what you become. Yeah. 
Okay. What shall we say of all these things? If God is for us, <coughs> is God for you? Yes. So how many times have we heard that <laughs> yes called you? Not because of what you have done, but because of the gift of grace that has been given to you by Jesus Christ. So, it is He that opened up the door for you to be accepted. Verse 32. He spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. How shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. So we are scared of making the wrong choices because of what is going to happen afterwards. I think the possibility of disappointments hinders us from so many blessings in our lives. Because with expectation <laughs> comes disappointments. I stole that from uh, Top Gun last night. <laughs> we are so afraid of disappointments because we need to make the wrong or the right decision. We live our lives trying to make the right decisions. Yeah. Have you ever met people It's like, I'm trying so hard, but the harder I try, the more I fail. That's it. You are trying. You are looking away from Christ and you are trying to produce what He has already done. When you start looking away from trying to be, then automatically everything will start falling into your pla in place. I don't know about you, but I've felt it in my life before. It's like, man, we're pushing for this thing, we're doing this, we're working hard, working your, how can I say it? The, your fingers to the bone. <laughs> and just nothing happens. As soon as something looks like it's starting to break through, then it just turns around again. And it feels like a vicious cycle where nothing kind of gets completed. And then there comes a point in time where you're just like, ah, screw it. <laughs> just let it go. And then, magically, things start falling into place. People come your way. Connections are being made. Why? Because the left and the right, the positive and the negative, the two brains, you didn't give them attention anymore. So, God could take over. See, we try to produce so many things. But sometimes, just need to let go. And let God. Yes. Now, please, do not get me wrong. I'm not saying, ah, now you can go do nothing. No. The Word tells us, whatever your hand finds to do, yes. do it as unto the Lord. Not do it as unto your victory. Do it as unto the Lord. But our hands are doing things to produce the victory that we think we need. Instead of using our lives as service to God. Who shall lay any charge, anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yet rather that he is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed, all day long, and we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, 
nor height, nor dead, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ, who is in Christ Jesus. So I am persuaded, neither your right or your wrong decision, neither your victories or your fails, neither your good or your bad is able to separate you from the love of God. Hallelujah. So as you can see, there are three sections. You need positive and negative to make a current. So the positive and negative, they are important, but they are nothing if they are not combined to produce the current, and then you have unity. I hope this helps someone this morning. Sabisa, I, I take that edge here, so thank you for that. And then we can start going through the scriptures and understand the power that is in Him. If we look at in Him, it means that everything that I am, the positive, the negative, the bad, the good, in Him produces a current that creates a blessing for everyone around me. And that's why we are a body. Because... Me and Tawaleng, we have differences, but together <laughs> we can bring unity. We can bring peace. That's why we are different. No, we don't have differences. Uh -uh. No, we're good. No, we're good. <laughs> and that's why the, the body is so important. That's why the assembly is so important that together we can see Christ. Together we can be the body. Now the word says, where two or more gather together in my name, I'm in the midst of them. So on my own, I won't be able to produce what God has called me. That's why He created the body. And that's why I really appreciate the family of God and being together in the house of God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's the word this morning. <laughs>